Chapter 10 Correction of Diverse Faults in the Clergy and People Proclamation of a Jubilee 1576 The immunity enjoyed by the saint in the midst of the dangers by which he was beset was universally ascribed to the special favor of God. Neither he nor any of the persons who accompanied him on his errands of mercy ever caught any infection during the whole time the pestilence lasted. Yet he never made use of any antidote but a sponge dipped in vinegar, which he carried in his hand in a little perforated case. It was always his maxim that in all matters pertaining to the exercise of his office, a bishop ought not to encumber himself with precautions, that he ought to fulfill all that is required of him, and leave the rest entirely to God's good providence. In all those things which are not of obligation, he thought he ought not to tempt God by incurring unnecessary risk, but to adopt every precaution prudence might dictate. He used also to lay down this rule for the guidance of his chaplains and others, often going so far as to dissuade them from exposing themselves without necessity. The virulence of the plague in its protracted duration had produced a great fear of death among the Milanese. The cardinal, who had all along recognized the prime cause of the visitation and the only true means of removing it, was not slow to improve this salutary fear and make it a means of drawing his people to do penance and abandon all evil courses. Like a good shepherd, he was most anxious to cure the infirmities of his flock by providing them with every remedy for their various needs, with sermons, with the sacraments, exhortations, and warnings, both in public and in private, and in this way brought back a number of sinners into the way of peace, especially among the upper classes and hardened sinners, two sets of persons most inaccessible to grace in ordinary times. He used to say that he reckoned this visitation of pestilence among his great consolations, as it had enabled him to work many conversions among his people. For when men find themselves face to face with death, their hearts are softened through their fear and expectation of the divine judgments, and are thus prepared to listen to counsels of amendment. It is an old saying that while the scourge of God brings the just to penance, it often tends to harden the reprobate, and it was verified at this time. There were some among the people who made it a time of more deliberate indulgence in sin than usual, taking advantage of the difficulties of the quarantine placed in the way of bringing offenders to justice, to carry on their vicious practices. But though the rod of human justice might fail to reach them, the scourge of God overtook many, as happened in a well-known case. Some Milanese nobles had gone for safety to a town at some distance. Having taken up the notion that there was no better preservative from contagion than leading a merry and self-indulgent life, they formed themselves into a society which they gave the name of the Academy of Love and abandoned themselves to all manner of profane and sensual pleasures, as if quite forgetful of their eternal salvation and the counsels of their pastor. But the hand of God found them out, and while they thought they had made themselves quite safe from every approach of the dreaded foe, the plague spot suddenly appeared in their midst. No effort sufficed to stay its ravages, and there was not a house which escaped its visitation. It was remarked that nowhere else had its havoc been so frightful and it was readily acknowledged that God had thereby designed to punish in a signal manner the dissolute life of these blinded sinners. The more so that it was equally noticeable that in those places where the warnings of the saint had been heeded, the pestilence passed them over or touched them but slightly. In preaching penance and amendment of life, the cardinal was careful, as usual, to set the example of practicing what he recommended. Accordingly, we find him at this time increasing his mortifications and setting himself with fresh fervor to gain greater holiness of life. Thus, among other things, he deprived himself of fires, also of flesh meat, and of the collation usually taken on the evening of fast days, thus only taking food once in the day, and he resumed his habit of sleeping upon boards. These hardships were not slight to one so delicately brought up, while the toils of his laborious career made them all the more severe. He began also to make it his practice to preach to the people on all festivals and twice in the week during Lent, also to attend the funerals of the canons, 
both on account of good example, as well as for his own interior perfection. During all this time he was carrying out his measures of reform, appointing visitors and others to see their proper execution in the different parts of the province. He put into force his regulations to secure the proper reverence for holy places, such as requiring the closing of the side doors of many churches, which people were prone to make use of as an easy way of passing from one street to another, as well as other important rules for the maintenance of order and discipline among the clergy, striving by exactness and paternal admonitions to raise them to a more perfect standard, in order that they might be as much respected for the sanctity of their lives as for their holy vocation. In carrying out these measures, he observed that the ancient and once universal practice of shaving the beard had in many cases fallen into disuse, and it had become very general among the clergy to trim it according to the fashion of the age among men of the world. He judged that this salutary season, as he was wont to term it, was favorable for obtaining the abolition of this abuse and he accordingly addressed his pastoral letter of the 30th of December, 1576, to his clergy upon this subject, calling upon them to conform to the ancient usage, which was still observed by some priests of Milan, although in other places it had altogether disappeared with other good customs. He showed how high their state was above that of the laity, and that it behooved them to walk worthily of their calling as consecrated to the service of God letting their outward demeanor bear witness to the recollection of their hearts, and that above all they should eschew all ostentation and display. In concluding, he touched upon some of the mystical lessons which the practice might be thought to symbolize, and exhorted them to adopt it willingly and promptly. At the same time, he himself appeared in public, conforming to the custom he recommended, and thus by exhortation and example, shortly obtained general observance of the rule notwithstanding some little reluctance on the part of certain dignitaries. Having established the custom, he further enforced it by a decree of his next synod, and took care that it should not again fall into abeyance during his life. Thus an example was set which produced fruit in other parts also, and the Milanese clergy were seen shaven and shorn, disciples of their great cardinal. Gregory the Thirteenth had granted a general jubilee as a means of inviting all the faithful to penance and prayer, that God would vouchsafe to remove the scourge of pestilence which was desolating other parts of Italy as well as Milan. St. Charles was desirous of publishing this jubilee in his diocese as soon as the quarantine should be ended, but when he came to confer upon the subject with the magistrates, he found them averse to closing the quarantine or to affording any facilities for renewed intercourse among the people for fear of opening up new fields for the spread of the plague. It was their mind, on the contrary, to prolong the quarantine until the city should be declared free from all trace of the disorder. The cardinal would not dispute the point with them, though he was sorry that his people should be deprived both of the application of the treasures of the church and of the benefit and consolation of visiting the churches and hearing the word of God at the holy season of Christmas. He wrote to represent this to the governor, who kept himself at a safe distance at Vigevano, and to warn him against putting his trust too exclusively in human remedies, pointing out that God had already shown his mercy by greatly mitigating the infliction, so that what remained was rather to be looked upon as the consequence of the pestilence than the pestilence itself. Neither did he omit to remind him that by the merciful providence of God it was manifest no evil had resulted from the earlier processions, though they took place at a time when the disease was raging most fiercely, and there was therefore less reason to expect any harm now when the mal malady had almost exhausted itself. His reasoning failed to remove the prejudices of the governor, and the cardinal yielded the point, deriving satisfaction from the fervor with which the people followed the exercises of piety he had prescribed for them. He deferred the publication of the Jubilee, therefore, till the spring of the following year, 1577, when he held processions like those before described, and attended by a great concourse of persons. The saint also appeared in the same penitential garb, his feet bare notwithstanding ice and snow, and together with his canons threw himself prostrate on the ground, while the litanies were sung, beseeching God that he would be propitious to his people, and graciously grant their supplications. This sight touched all hearts, and moved them to contrition 
in preparation for receiving the sacraments of penance and Holy Communion and the benefits of the Jubilee. He preached on each of the three days with an unction and fervor that moved the congregation to tears. Not only in Milan, but throughout the whole diocese, numbers of people were led to follow the example of their holy pastor, walking in the processions barefoot and showing every sign of penitence and sorrow for sin.